Thank you for joining today's webinar. We'll get started here in just one moment. So get comfortable. Hi, today's webinar is titled 18, Oracle 18C. We're looking at a new feature today um, called Private Temporary Tables. So you may have already run across these and we'll take a look at them in detail today. And we'll also throw in a little bit about global temporary tables as well. Again, my name is John Mullins from Themis. You can see my email address there on the screen, or you should be able to see that. So jmullins at themisinc.com. Um, as we go through the course of this webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to send them to that email. That's kind of the best way to do it with the short time frame that we have. It's a little bit difficult sometimes to address questions along the way. But if you send me an email, I'll get back to you as quickly as possible. Also, um, you see a couple of other uh, addresses there on the screen, uh, themisinc.com. Feel free to go out there. You can see a listing of, of uh, all our courses that we have to offer. Plus, um, this webinar, the slides are out there currently. So if you go out there to the webinars tab, uh, themisinc.com slash webinars, you can see uh, the slides are out there now. You can download those. And plus, in, in, a, in a day or so, probably tomorrow, um, the recording of today's webinar will be out there also. And so you can rewatch that or have uh, somebody else watch it. If they happen to miss today's webinar, they can do that. All they have to do is, is register to watch that. No big deal. So uh, a couple of other addresses out there. Uh, you can also, we're on Twitter, so feel free to follow us on Twitter as well. So let's go ahead and jump in here and get started. A little bit about myself, I noticed a lot of the names out there look familiar from other webinars or for other classes that we've taught here at Themis. So uh, you're familiar with who I am, but, but in case you're new, my name is John Mullins um, here with Themis. And again, you can see my email address there again. I've been working with Oracle for over 33 years. So I started back in the early 80s working with Oracle version 5. In fact, it was version 5.122 on a DEC Ultrix operating system back then. Um, and have worked for uh, various uh, companies since then, including worked for Boeing for 10 years and various consulting companies and training companies. And over the years have taught well over 300 classes uh, to all kinds of different uh, audiences along the way. I am an Oracle certified uh, DBA and I also am a certified technical trainer. So that should all look familiar to those that have been in my classes before or in this webinar before. And again, glad to have you with us today. Like I said, I'm, I'm with Themis and here's just a little bit about them. Again, you can go out to the website at themisinc.com. Lots of classes going on this time of year, people trying to get training done before the end of the year. So um, take a look out there. If there's something you don't see, there's, um, I'll give you some contact information at the end. You can either contact me or John Cacavell. Um, some of you have talked to him before, but I'll give you his email address and phone number at the end of the webinar. Uh, Themis has been around for a long time. We teach all kinds of different classes, as you can see there, DB2, Oracle, Linux. Uh, those are all very popular there. Um, Java, very popular as well. So lots of other classes out there also. So feel free to visit our website. And again, all the past recordings of webinars are out there. So there's a lot of different webinars that you can access out there. And those don't cost anything. So um, webinars on uh, mainframe type items, DB2 items, Java, uh, web type related items, and of course, Oracle as well. So feel free to visit those. Here's some of the courses that are kind of related to today's webinar, but again, we have quite a few uh, Oracle courses available. So um, 18C new features will be coming up, and then uh, and of course, anything that's related to SQL or PL SQL would be appropriate as well. All right, but let's get to the point of why we're here today. So we're gonna look at a new feature called private temporary tables. And I ran across this, I was working with someone not too long ago, and, and that person was uh, using global temporary tables. And 
they were uh, having some performance issues with those. So they, they were looking at converting their global temporary tables into uh, Oracle or PL SQL collections or arrays and trying to do a comparison against those two there. And then, you know, doing that uh, comparison, uh, ran across this particular feature with 18C, which if you haven't looked lately, 18C is available for a number of different operating systems out there. Um, if you haven't heard, if I think most people have, but uh, 18 being Oracle's new versioning numbering scheme. Um, so we'll go with the uh, the year as part of the version now, kind of a, of a Microsoft similar type thing. So 18C next year will be Oracle 19 and so on. So one major version release each year with some minor ones once a quarter as well. But uh, while we were looking at those global temporary tables and those PL SQL collections, um, I started thinking about these private temporary tables um, and uh, how they could be used as well. So the, that's the kind of the reason that we're talking about them today in today's webinar. Um, they're a very simple concept to use, and we'll compare them to global temporary tables here in just a moment. Uh, very easy to use as well. Um, they do have a fair number of restrictions on them, so we'll want to make sure that we understand what those are also. All right, we know that now with 18C out, that Oracle supports two types of temporary tables, uh, global temporary tables, which have been around for a long time, and then the new private temporary tables that we're going to see today. Many of you have used the global temporary tables maybe in your environments there. We know that a global temporary table is actually a, a physical permanent table object that's out there. Um, the data that's in the global temporary table is temporary. The object itself is permanent. So we can say the data within the global temporary table is private. It's accessed by session, as many of you might know. Uh, or have used in the past as well. So I have a single global temporary table. I can have multiple sessions accessing it. As each ses session is accessing it, they're accessing only their sessions data within that global temporary table um, there. We know that the global temporary table has a couple of options on it, like on commit delete rows or on commit preserve rows. And we can do things with global temporary tables like um, we can have indexes on them, we can have triggers on them, um, they can also have statistics. Um, in 12C and later, some of this stuff has changed a little bit with global temporary tables. Uh, those statistics that I just mentioned um, can be session specific in 12C and later. And also 12C introduced a temporary undo for global temporary uh, tables. Now, in the past, if you were doing, say, inserts, updates, and deletes on a global temporary table, um, they were the images of that those changes, the before and after, were processed just with regular undo, and that goes along with everything else on the system too. So uh, you could add some contention there. Uh, you may have had to make your uh, undo table space larger than maybe you'd like. So in 12C and later, you have temporary undo. Um, which would go along with your global temporary tables there. Okay, so I uh, won't spend a whole lot of time there on just the global temporary tables, just kind of refresh our memory, some of the things we can and can't do uh, with those. Uh, temporary, you know, typically those global temporary tables are usually part of a bigger process, a multi-step process. So um, it, this is data that we may consider to be kind of transient in nature where we're getting data from multiple sources, loading them into a temporary table, doing something with it, uh, massaging the data, reducing the data. Maybe we take that data and load it into the next temporary table along the way and eventually get down to what the main purpose of our process is, whether it's reporting or what if games or something else along the way. Now with private temporary tables, which is the focus of today's webinar, um, rather than being a, a physical uh, table, a, a table that you can see in, say, the data dictionary and such. Uh, we're talking about a memory-based table, okay, and this memory-based table um, goes away either at the end of the session, so when you log out or disconnect, or at the end of the transaction, depending on which option you use when you create 
uh, the private temporary table in the first place. So now we're talking about not only is the data temporary, like with a global temporary table, we're talking about the table is temporary also. Um, and that's what makes me think of uh, like uh, PL SQL collections or arrays, which are memory objects as well. And those, we could have an array of, of a table type, so an array of an array essentially, or an array of records, we can do that as well, uh, which an array of records is essentially kind of like a table, right? And so um, with the private temporary table, it's in memory only, uh, we'll see some options that we can use with it, like on commit drop definition or on commit preserve definition. Um, we'll talk about, a, it does have a fair number of restrictions to go with it, so that'll be one thing that we'll want to cover for today as well. So let's take a look and see what these guys are all about. All right, um, these are some bullets that uh, I found within some Oracle documentation that I wanted to share with you of you know, why would we want to, or maybe what, what would be some of the reasons we would maybe have a need for a private temporary table. And, and one of the reasons is the same reason you would have for a global temporary table, and that's the first sub bullet there. You know, we've got data that's you know populated, it's read a few times, it's dropped, it's reloaded, it's changed, it's removed. Um, it's kind of, we're trying to, you know, basically have a save point for data that we're processing in a multi-step process. That's that first sub bullet there. So first sub bullet kind of applies to both private temporary tables and global temporary tables as well. The, the second and third ones I think are quite appropriate. Um, Take a look at that second one there. When the creation of a temporary table um, won't start a new transaction, in other words, it won't do an implicit commit. Okay, we know that there's certain commands in SQL that do implicit commits, things like create, alter, drop, truncate, uh, to name some. Um, so in this case, if we were to create a private temporary table, that will not do a, a implicit commit. You know, a regular create table will, um, and other create commands would as well. So that's a that's kind of a nice thing about it. Um, and then the last one, you know, depending on our application and how we're using these temporary tables and such, uh, we can have different sessions, and they can all create a temp a private temporary table with the same name. So we don't have to worry about um, different parts of an application. Uh, maybe it's a multi-step process, creating these private uh, temporary table, I'll just say it that way for now, creating a temporary table, and the temporary table is already created, or we don't have to check for the existence of the temporary table first. If it does not exist, then create it. If it is out there, then use it type of thing. We can just create it with the same name, because remember, these are session specific, okay? Um, it's kind of like they kind of took a piece of the global temporary table that was uh, related to your session only and gave you an entire table like that. It's almost like a partition um, for your for your session, but it's a single table. So it's a, in this case, um, so it's a little bit different along those way, lines as well. Okay. So that's kind of it's just some maybe some uses for those private temporary tables. Again, some people may have, like with a PL SQL, if they're writing stored procedures and such, they may be using arrays or collections to do the same thing. Uh, kind of depends on your process and what you, you need it to do and what the different steps look like there. All right, here's some of those restrictions I was talking about. Um, the table name itself must start with a certain prefix and there is a default prefix that goes with it. It's defined by a parameter or initialization parameter within Oracle called private underscore temp underscore table underscore prefix. The default is ORA dollar sign PTT underscore. All right, so if you leave the default alone, Oracle's expecting that when you create a private temporary, temporary table, you're gonna name it with that prefix on the front, and then after that underscore, you can put whatever you want on there. Okay, if you try to create the table um, with another name uh, other than with the leading prefix on the front, you're gonna get an ORA-00903, uh, which says invalid table name. Uh, likewise, if you try to create a regular table, regular database table, 
um, and you just say create table and give it a name of ORA dollar sign PTT underscore something, that'll give you an error message as well. Um, so if you try to do that, you're going to get an ORA dash, uh, let's see, the number is 32463, and the message says something like, cannot create an object with a name matching private temporary table prefix. Okay, that's a pretty good detailed message, I think, for a change, right? So they're going to have certain names for them. You can change that uh, prefix as well, uh, either with an alter session command or with an alter system command, either way on that one. All right, uh, private temporary tables cannot be created as a sys type of user. And again, they're only visible to the session that created it. So with that in mind, uh, it should make sense that we can't do things like grant select on the private temporary table to other users because they can't see it because they're in different sessions. So that last bullet should make that pretty clear to us. Um, we cannot have indexes and materialized views. Columns can't have default values um, and they can't be accessed via database links to name a few others. And then lastly, some of the other restrictions here. Um, this one um, has a few kind of caveats with it. Um, we can't create statistics or database table object statistics for an existing uh, private temporary table. So if you've created the primary temporary table, and we'll see how to do that here in just a moment, you can see one example at the bottom of this particular slide as well. Um, if you just create, so do, so let's say we do this, create private temporary table, we give it a name, here's the columns in it, on commit, whatever, it creates an empty table at that point. All right, if it, later we add data to the table and now we want to go back and generate statistics on it with, let's say, the DBMS underscore stats package or with an analyze command, DBMS stats package is what most of us would do in that case, um, that it can't do that. And the reason being is, you know, this is a, a truly temporary table in memory. So it's not in the data dictionary uh, within the Oracle database. So there's no place within the, the regular uh, structure of the metadata for us to actually store those statistics. Now we'll see some data dictionary views that there is another way to get statistics on these private temporary tables, and that's the second bullet here. If we do a, a create table as select, a CTAS, um, statistics will be automatically generated during the load part of that select. So we know the create table as select does two things. It creates a table and it uh, executes a select statement. If there's any results of the select, it'll load them into the table. And if we use that method to create our PTT, and there's an example of that at the bottom of this particular slide, then st statistics will be loaded um, for this particular table, at least initially. Okay, down the road, if, if we remove data, add data, whatever, and we want to regenerate those statistics, that will, will fail for us. And that'll give us a, an error message as well. That'll give us kind of a general one. It'll be an ORA-20,000. It'll say unable to analyze table and then something along, along the lines of insufficient privileges or your table does not exist because it, it exists in memory, but it doesn't exist uh, in the database itself physically. So there's a couple of things with uh, statistics there. We'll see some of the data dictionary views in a minute. So if we do do this create private temporary table as select, we can go out and take a look at those statistics through one of the data dictionary views that are available to us. So we have that restriction as well. A um, couple of other ones that aren't on the slide, I'll just mention briefly here. Uh, private temporary tables, uh, they cannot, cannot be partitioned. So you may want to jot that down. Uh, they cannot have a primary key. And I just mentioned that we can't do a grant because they're, they're session specific. So nobody else can see it anyway. Plus, um, if you're one of those users, users that likes to take advantage of the flashback query option, uh, we can't do that with a private temporary table uh, either. Okay, I mentioned also that um, when we do create the private temporary table, it does not do an implicit commit. Now, one thing about this, as we take a look at some of the, the syntax here, and I'll go to the next page, and we can kind of look at it in general, and then we'll look at some examples that are related to it as well. 
notice that the option on there says on commit drop definition or on commit preserve definition. And what the on commit is really saying there is um, whenever the transact whenever the transaction ends, that's when we either drop the temporary table or we preserve it and it'll go away when we log out or disconnect later. So it's just whenever the transaction ends, not explicitly when we do a commit. You know, a commit will end your transaction, right? We all know that. But also a rollback will as well. So, um, you know, it says on commit drop definition, we might do a rollback and then all of a sudden, not only is the data gone, but the table's gone as well. <laughs> all right, so what the on commit is really telling us is just when the transaction ends, then the definition will go away. That also means things like other commands that cause a transaction to end. Um, implicitly, for example, other creates, alters, or drops. Those also do implicit commits, which, which would cause our temporary table to go away. Um, so we have to be kind of careful with that because we're, we're used to those types of things, maybe undoing or committing our data um, with global temporary tables, but we're not used to them um, getting rid of our entire table in that case. All right, so in this case here, you know, private temporary table really means temporary table, whereas before the global temporary table was a little bit misleading in that the temporary table, the global temporary table really sticks around. And you, you can see the definitions for drop definition and preserve definition down below there. So drop definition, on commit drop definition. So ending of a transaction causes the table to go away. Preserve definition, ending of a transaction, the table is still there. And it'll go away when we disconnect or log out. And here's a couple coming up on your screen just now, just a couple of examples of some very simple ones. All right, the keyword here that's been added is the word private. Create private temporary table. And remember, it has to start with that prefix, whatever that parameter um, that we had before has been set to. So remember, we had that parameter called private temp table prefix separated by underscores there. If we try anything other there, we'll get an error message about an invalid table name. All right, so there's some very simple ones at that point there. A um, couple things that are related to these. If I create these temporary tables and I, I have a multi-step either SQL process with some inserts, some updates, deletes, some selects, whatever along the way, um, maybe PL SQL comes into play. And what about PL SQL accessing these private temporary tables? Well, we've got a few restrictions around that as well. Um, with a PL SQL program, if it's an anonymous block, there's no problem. So step one could be create private temporary table, whatever, and then I enter into a PL SQL anonymous block. It can go ahead and access that temporary table from that PL SQL anonymous block. That's no problem. However, if I create the private temporary table um, and then I have a stored procedure, stored function, a stored PL SQL program of some type, um, it doesn't know about um, those private temporary tables. So we can't use these with stored programs unless, there's a big unless with it, we create them within the stored program as part of a dynamic SQL type statement. Okay, that would be perfectly fine. Um, so we can use that to build the statement and then maybe do an execute immediate within our stored PL SQL program, and then we can access it that way. But if it's been created outside of the stored program, when we compile the stored program, it, it doesn't know about it at that point. In fact, it gets a, an error message um, if we try to do that. Okay, so a few restrictions about PL SQL accessing it uh, as well there. All right, we have a few uh, data dictionary views that we can look up information about any pr uh, private temporary tables that we have. There's only two of them. Uh, notice that uh, in this case, we have a DBA underscore, and we have a user underscore. Um, so the user underscore will show us information about ones that are within our current session that we've already created for this session. Uh, and they're still there because we haven't either done a commit or end a transaction. And of course, we haven't logged out either. And then we have the DBA private one, uh, which shows us information about all the temporary tables in the database, even from other sessions. And we can't necessarily access those and select from those, but we can see which ones are out there in the database there. Some of you might be familiar with the Oracle Data Dictionary Views 
we have the user underscore it usually gives you information about stuff that your schema or your user ID is the owner or creator of. And then typically we also have one for all underscore, uh, which gives us information about stuff we have access to, but that should make sense why we don't have that in this case, because other private temporary tables we don't have access to from our session. So that view would not make sense in this case. All right, so you can kind of see, if I go back here just for a second at the creates here. So typically we're gonna create these, um, you know, you know, if we compare it to the global temporary table, we have to kind of ask, okay, why would I do this versus the global temporary table? Um, you know, this is not truly that physical object which sometimes people have problems with, especially depending on their application. If different applications, uh, or if an application is run more than one time from different sessions, and it has a need to create a temporary ta table as part of its process, in this case, they're, it's they're very nice, it's very separated out by session. They can all have the same name. I don't have to worry about each application piece of code generating a new name if I wanna do that. Or um, even though it's kind of nice that with the global temporary table that uh, it's separated by session and I only see my stuff, but it's still a single table with multiple sessions accessing it. So we still have some uh, contention issues there. Although there's some nice things we can do with global temporary tables too that we can't do with the private ones, like things like creating indexes and uh, maybe having statistics on them as well. Uh, I don't see a lot of people using triggers on their temporary tables, but you know that again is possible with a global temporary table. So I think this this is one of those features that if you have those multi-step processes and you don't want to be using PL SQL to store temporary data into arrays or collections, especially complex arrays or collections, or like an array of records, for example. Uh, this can simplify our process and the maintenance, since it, we create it and then it goes away, the maintenance of it isn't an issue as well along the way. So again, a, a feature that's very easy to create uh, very easy to use because now at this point, once we create the tables, we just you know insert data into the table, update, delete, select from it, maybe take the select the result of the select and put it in another primary primary uh, private temporary table until we get down to the data that we actually want to use at that point. So it's a very good, as it says, temporary stopping point to uh, move on before we move on to the next step. So like it has many of the same benefits as the global temporary table. So I just want to take a few moments today and just make you aware of this particular feature. Maybe you see a need for it now once you get to 18C, um, uh, maybe not. A lot of us aren't on 18C just yet in a lot of our production environments, but we might be in, in our non-production environment. So it gives us plenty of time to kind of test it out, uh, see if we have other processes that might be able to be replaced by these types of features here. Uh, or if we ha have a new idea, this might be able to take care of it for us as well. So I think it's a pretty good new feature there. Um, we'll kind of see if it, how it plays out to us as far as benefits go. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea. I just wanted to introduce the topic to you, let, it, let you know what it was, uh, let you know what the restrictions are, um, let you know how to create it. And then once it's created, you use it just like a global temporary table you would in the past there as well. Um, so we insert, update, and delete. And we have different uh, options available with it. So we have the on commit drop definition and on commit preserve definition. We can also do a create private temporary table as select if we want to load it up that way. So, and basically it, it has a lot of the same uses as the global, global temporary table would. Although in this case here, it also has some things that since it's not really a table and is really just in memory, uh, there's some things that we can get around as well. So maybe some privileges that we don't need um, and also some other uh, physical things that we can't do, which we would need privileges for as well, like creating indexes, uh, triggers, and statistics also. All right, if you have any questions or are uh, following this up, feel free to send me an email at jmullins at themasinc.com. 
Um, we do have an upcoming webinar webinar in November on November 7th at 11:30 Eastern time. This has to do with the mainframe there, object relational mapping. So pass that on to some of your friends. You can see more information about it at our themasync.com webinar site out there. And again, the slides are out there for this webinar today, plus a recording of today's webinar will be out there in about a day or so. So you can feel free to pass that on to your coworkers or friends. Um, it, for other information about courses and such, again, go to our website, themasync.com. You can also contact John Cacaval at jcac at themasync.com. Uh, he'll be more than happy to give you more information about courses, webinars, um, all, our courses. If you don't see a course out there listed, you can ask about it. We do lots of customizations of courses as well. Um, and so feel free to look out there on a regular basis. We're adding new courses all the time, no matter what the topic is. And uh, you can get more information from John on that. And uh, other than that, feel free to send me emails at jmullins at themasync.com. So hopefully you enjoyed today's webinar on private temporary tables. Very simple topic, uh, nice short topic for today. And uh, send me an email if you have any questions. Other than that, thank you for attending today. Um, everybody have a good end to your week and weekend coming up. And hopefully I'll talk to you again soon in a future webinar or in a future class. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.